If everybody could sit down, please, we are going to get started. The future of genre publishing. Right. Uh, so, thanks for your patience, everyone. I know we are about, about five, ten minutes over. Uh, so, my name is Idanjay Vijayaratna. I am a data scientist, except I rarely use that intro as a data scientist because now, nowadays when I, whenever I say that, people go, oh, you work for something like Cambridge Analytica. I, I don't work for the Cambridge Analytica type of people. Let's just put it that way. I am more, I consider myself more the lawful good type of Cambridge Analytica <laughs> people, right? <laughs> which, which I suppose everyone, every, every villain would probably give that line. But no, really, um, I, I try to do stuff for the greater good. Uh, so how this whole thing started was, well, we were in Bali. And uh, for the 20 books, Bali, and you'll probably find like parts of the Bali crew just walking around. Um, and I had sort of been invited by Craig. And he had said, you know, what the hell are you doing with all your traditional stuff? Why don't you come over and sort of learn what this indie publishing stuff is about? And I thought, okay, Bali's it's almost in my backyard. Might as well go there and might as well learn. And so I spent a few days having the most amazing conversations with the most amazing people and getting drunk quite a lot. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, you know, in doubt. When in doubt, apply alcohol. Things turn out better. And so at about... So it just so happened that I had run out of alcohol and the shops had closed. And at 3.30 in the morning, I had absolutely nothing better to do than, you know, I had five packs of cigarettes. I thought, okay, might as well try and finish one of them in the morning. And while looking for coffee, I just sat down and started thinking about publishing. And it started sort of with the Gutenberg Press. Uh, and I started thinking about points of change in publishing that had led all led to all of this happening to the point where, you know, a random author from Sri Lanka ends up with uh, TV option deals and all that stuff uh, out of just like out of nowhere. And I sort of started thinking about the history of change that had happened. And it's a very common observation that the Gutenberg Press changed print for the world, basically. Until the Gutenberg Press happened, a book was really expensive to produce. So you would never see books in homes. You would probably see books in churches, and even then you'd see maybe one or two books that the monks had laboriously copied by hand and doodled in the margins and so on and so forth. And then the Gutenberg Press happened. Right? The books became so much more cheaper to produce, and there was an explosion in the amount of knowledge and in the stories you could tell. And that kind of drove the Renaissance and so many other, uh, so many periods of periods where knowledge just spread out almost instantly. But it occurred to me, thinking about stuff, that the Gutenberg Press was not exactly the most revolutionary thing. Fine, it did make it easier and cheaper and faster to produce books, but books still had meat space problems. They had actual physical volume, they, had, they uh, had weight, they had to comprise of a certain number of dead trees, and you then eventually, after getting your ink on this dead tree, you now had to ship it, sometimes halfway across the world. And it was quite natural that over time, the people with the capital to produce, to actually to produce these books, to cut down trees in large numbers, to process them, to perform the whole act of warehousing, to then distribute it. It kind of made sense that these people would eventually rise to be the people who control the publishing industry. Because you had to have a certain amount of capital and they had to be invested in pushing these things forward. Where that really broke was with Amazon. Was rather with the concept of the ebook, which didn't really take off, but it was it wasn't until you had the merger of a marketplace, a discovery function, and the ability to participate in that marketplace as an author instantaneously. You just take a Word file, upload it, and suddenly you're read from Colombo to Colombia. And none of the distribution has to take place. The warehousing doesn't have to play, take place. The shipping doesn't have to take place. So suddenly a large chunk of that power block what we think of as the gatekeepers or the publishers. A large chunk of that just gets automated out of picture. So I just kept thinking along these lines and then writing the stuff down and so on and so forth. And eventually I went to sleep. And then the next day, I woke up because my server was melting. 
because Michael Ondele had discovered this blog post that I'd written, and he'd posted that in the 20 books to 50K group. And my server was screaming. I mean, there was fire. There was all sorts of stuff going on in the background. There were hundreds of comments that hadn't been processed. And I was going, no, 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 delete, 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 right? Uh, so then I was given the opportunity to come and talk about this a little bit more at length. And I thought back to that original blog post of what I said. And I went back and made a few changes. So let's start with sort of, yeah, right. So the original blog post was titled, The Future of Publishing. And I realized that was dishonest. Because background, I do a little bit of futurism work for the United Nations. Sometimes when people go, um, that was, well, sometimes they'll go that, uh, hey, Yudha, we want to study the future of the Asia Pacific region, future of warfare in these countries. And I'm usually the guy called to do this stuff. And um, one of the problems of forecasting the future is, as William Gibson said quite recently, uh, it's like going to the store and buying ice cream and trying to come back with it. And by the time you come back, the damn thing's melted. So I retitled it A Future of Publishing. And I'm going to tell you why it's not the future first. And that's because of this bird. So this is called a black swan. In, uh, in mathematical terms, in sort of mathematical and financial circles, the, there's a guy called Nassim Nicholas Talib who pointed out that we humans form rules on really bad logic. If you see a million white swans, you eventually form a rule in your head that goes, all swans are white. And then along comes the black swan. And this thing completely confirms expectations. So black swan is basically used to refer to an unpredictable event far beyond normal expectations, has a catastrophic impact. And funnily enough, you can look back and go, oh, I see what happened there, and I can explain it. But a feature of black swans is they cannot be explained in advance. So for example, notable black swans, a whole bunch of financial crisis, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Titanic, The Lord of the Rings, The Stand, The Da Vinci Code, Ready Player One, Bitcoin, Will White's Unsold. Uh, for all, any Wuxia readers here? Yeah. So Will White's Unsold, Andy Weir's The Martian, there's a few other books there, Dennis Taylor's We Are Legion, A.G. Riddle is a black swan, right? It's, some of these things just cannot be explained beforehand. So to recap, black swans can't be predicted Really enormous nonlinear success or failure makes sense in hindsight, but they're kind of just unhelpful birds. They're really assholes, <laughs> uh, right? So, so all of this is to say why it is not the future of publishing, because these damn birds exist. So let's go to the world of white swans, which is where things become a lot more predictable and a lot more understandable. And I, and I looked around, and I wanted to start with the world of film and with the world of video games. Because you see, film and video games are quite similar to our space, the indie author space, in that they have both had an indie space for a long time. They've also experienced digitization. The revolution that sort of you know, went from Gutenberg to Amazon, that happened a lot earlier in the film spheres and in the video game spheres. And that brought along disruption at larger scales. And the, and the really interesting thing is the upfront capital costs of producing a film or a video game are just so high that you really fail long before you start. So you need to be very, very aware of what you're doing, otherwise your bank account gets screwed. Indie authors, on the other hand, can afford to experiment. So some of the lessons that we draw are not necessarily robust because we can afford to throw stuff at the wall and then see what sticks and say, okay, let's take that. Whereas these people have to front load a lot of the analysis. So I thought, OK, let's look at white swans. Now, in the world of white swans, there is uh, Christian von is uh, the head of IP development. He's a very, very, very well reputed um, analyst of the industry. And he points out that in successful video game companies, right, a standalone game is regarded as heresy because a standalone game has exactly one chance of success. And mind you, this is the world of white swans, right? Uh, he points out that it is the job of a successful video game uh, industry or 
studio, let's say, to produce multiple games that has what he calls a tentpole, that is a set of characters that are in interesting and memorable, a fictional universe that can accommodate a large number of stories, and it's, it's, there's a recognizable branding effort that ties multiple entries in this universe together. And it's different, but again, not too different. If you, are, if you know that your market are people who play Call of Duty, you would give them the next big shooter using Call of Duty-like mechanics. You would not make it something that you pay with, that you, where you shoot with your pinky finger, because that would just be too weird, even if it is, even if it meets audience expectations, it's just gonna be far too different for them to absorb. So he put together this set of laws, and I extended this to the world of film. That is to say, actually, go back a bit. Yeah, so he put together like a sort of set of laws for what a tent pole should look like, and he said, if you follow these laws, uh, and that is in the space of white swans, you're going to make money. You're also going to have success as an indie studio, as a, video, as a video game production company or a film production company. You are going to have long-standing success. And this is the closest anyone's got to a formula for success in these creative industries. A single tentpole franchise where you have characters that are really memorable. And from film, we can extract others. A consistent speed of production that is in film, it's usually a year-on-year -year delivery. In video games, it's usually year-on-year -year delivery. It's, it doesn't necessarily have to be fast production, but it has to be highly predictable. Your audience has to, go, has to be able to go, okay, next year at this time, I will have the next John Wick to watch. Next year at this time, I'll have the next Marvel movie to watch. And in, in fact, if you look at a lot of the movies that you consume, a lot of the video games that you hear about, you'll see that they perfectly fit these criteria, particularly if you look at the Marvel and Disney uh, sort of franchises that they run. They have this large tent pole that basically covers everything. And the sixth over there is they rely on multiple products in the franchise to boost each other because they're not relying on Black Swans, they're not relying on that one epic successful uh, sort of product. They rely on multiple products that are related within this universe to keep egging each other on and building a fan base. And I think, I hope that a lot of you can immediately translate this in your heads to books. But for those who haven't, let's sort of translate. I, back again. Yes, I have my mortal enemy here. Uh, so consider books, right? You want a fictional universe that's large enough to support more than one type of story. If you think of science fiction and fantasy, you want a universe large enough that it can support a romance subplot. You want it to have, you know, want it to support space opera. Someone goes, oh, hey, I think a police procedure in this universe might be nice. Well, can you pull that off? And you design the universe and the parameters of the universe explicitly so that that can happen. Uh, branding effort, of course. Uh, I'm sure you've been attending plenty of talks about why covers and consistency in fonts and themes and usage are important. Uh, and a consistent speed of production. I think that's probably been hammered into your heads right now. And that's almost often, often like second nature by now. And you rely on multiple books in your franchise to sell, to sell each other. Part of the wisdom of the best, the thing that sells your existing book best is the next book, right? So now we go to the next slide. <laughs> right. So this, this sort of dovetailed with my thinking of that history going down from Gutenberg to Amazon to so on and so forth. And I last stopped there at this thing of, well, if all of the needs of warehousing and franchising and shipping and distribution, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things are taken care of, or if these things don't need to exist anymore, well then, you know, why do publishers exist or what do publishers look like? And in the indie space, initially it was somewhere in sort of the 2000, Eight, nine, ten. it was individual authors who were really pushing or generating the bulk of the revenue and so on and so forth. Now you'll find it's those, some of those individual authors don't exist anymore. Those who have, have, e have sort of turned into content operations in their own right, or publishers in their own right. You'll notice that a lot of them, particularly a lot of people who have given you talks, have 
sort of turned, have sort of created that tentpole franchise, either by accident or by intentional design. And they've realized that there is enough reader demand for it that they can't fulfill it themselves. So they create a co-pub where they sort of collaborate with multiple authors to keep pushing out content within this tentpole that we've just described. So, like I said, standalone book has only one shot of success and they've sort of internalized that wisdom and they keep pushing it forward. Right? So, co-pubs are kind of like the eternal, is where we are right now in the publishing industry, right? You have your traditional publishers, they're floating around and they're doing, they're doing work. And they, um, I know there's a lot of wisdom that says traditional publishing is dead. I don't necessarily think so. I think traditional publishing has enough people and enough money that they can, they are now picking up on what's happening and so on and so forth and internalizing it. But nor is it the wild west where you can just pick up a keyboard and go make your millions anymore. Now there's this smaller sort of startup, almost startup type operation in the sphere, which is basically the co-pub, right? They're kind of like a medieval foundry with one person at the center and a bunch of like lesser smiths working on stuff or a two-man writing operation or a husband and wife duo. And I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm seeing some heads that are nodding, and I'm pretty sure you've come across a few operations like that here itself. These things are extraordinary, like co-pubs have a lot of staying power, because they're, A, they're, they're very fast and they're lean. Uh, so they don't have the overhead of a really large publisher. But they're also not too large that they can't pivot and that they can't produce. So they can keep working on multiple, they can keep working on different universes, they can keep putting out, uh, they can effectively outsell solo operations without even trying, but they don't have the infrastructure overhead that makes them slow and, and sort of unwieldy. Right. And there's some prominent examples, right? And I've picked a few from Trad as well, because I want to show that this is not just an indie author phenomenon. Uh, so you have James S.A. Corey, uh, does anyone know James S.A. Corey? The Expanse, yeah? So that's two people, right? That's Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham. That's not one person. Uh, James Patterson, of course, one of the most uh, vocal proponents of this model. Patterson essentially created a name for himself with thrillers and then said, you know what, I'm gonna write outlines and I'm gonna get other writers to write the meat of the book and I'm gonna collaborate with them. So he's the master smith at the center of this massive co-pub operation. There's Richard Fox. There's Nicholas Sainsbury Smith, and some of these people will be here. I hope you don't hate me for this. Um, Chris Kennedy, Mike Krause, and Spack and Cole, and everyone else who's using ghostwriters. And I put, you know who you are, because I certainly don't. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to. Uh, so the, the really good part about a co-pub is the more I looked at it, the more it seemed that a co-pub was perfectly poised to sort of design and deliver tentpole franchises. They could look at the space and go, right, how do we create characters that, that actually appeal to the audience? And if this fails, how do we move on to the next one with minimal damage done to our bank accounts? And a co-pub is almost perfectly poised to do that. They're poised to pivot. So which is why they're kind of like the eternal startups. Next. Right, so, and the co-pub is interesting because I thought, okay, fine, co-pubs exist, maybe this is, this is just a weird sort of author thing. You know, maybe despite us notoriously being bad at working at each other, we've, we've somehow sort of navigated to this two-player model. But the two-player model kind of exists everywhere else you look, like Lennon McCartney, Jagger and Richards, Bjorn, there's Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Pretty much every creative industry that you look, if you look at it over a long period of time, you will find a two-person operation that functions like this, has functioned for an extraordinary long and productive period of time, and is really a creative powerhouse. And that's because in a, in a co-pub, naturally one person can take up the slack that the other person doesn't. When one person's running dry, the other person steps in and so on and so forth. So co-pubs also have risks though, and that, problem is where we sort of run into this concept of the attention economy. So the attention economy is this, I mean, ignore the sort of economics up there, but what it basically says is at a point, if you, you have to start treating reader attention as a finite resource, 
And at a point, readers are going to run out of attention to stop giving the same damn thing. So if you keep doing the exact same thing, if you keep writing the exact same 10 pole franchise, you're eventually going to start losing readers. And in fact, we were just having a conversation about this outside the film with recently the crash of the Terminator 4 movie. And we were wondering, well, that's a known franchise. It's a franchise that has legions of fans. It should be selling. Why isn't it selling? And the reason is people are just tired of it. So there comes a point where you have to go, you know what, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And there comes a point where you have to pivot. Right? So Copubs, so we sort of established that Copubs present a stable and very competitive model. The good part, the good news about a Copub, as I've said, is that they can do precisely this, the pivot function. Uh, but the ones that will survive long term, again, if you look back at that list of creatives that sort of have dominated their individual fields for a long period of time, they have a tendency to disregard black swans. And that's, that's critical because uh, I don't know how many people were paying attention to Will White when he blew up recently. Uh, nobody? Right, so, yeah. So Will White, you know, shot to number two on the Kindle store with Unsold. And for a brief moment, every person was going, oh my God, he must have cracked a new subgenre. Everybody go write whoosh here. But Will White was a black swan. Will White was not where the tent pole franchises game lay. Those, those who actually went, mm, yeah, there, there's too many variables there and I can't really predict this phenomena. Let me just continue doing what I've been doing and let me continue building my own franchise this way. Those people didn't lose time and effort in the inevitable crash that followed people trying to just throw themselves out of Will White. The same thing had happened, has happened for uh, Hugh Harvey, the same thing has happened for pretty much any indie science fiction or fantasy author, a lot of trad people as well, who suddenly make it to the top for no explainable reason, and people go, let me copy that. So really successful co-pubs disregard black swarms. They keep building their secure tentpole franchises. They play that old rule of making sure that work is available in all formats. Uh, they take care not to supersaturate a market. They make sure that the reader attention doesn't really get squandered across 500 books in the same universe and so on and so forth. And they keep investing small amounts, and this is pretty important. Um, I was looking at the ultimate producers of tentpole franchises, which is Disney. And I was looking at what the current chairman of Disney, um, what, he's, what sort of lines of thinking that he's been uh, shedding whenever he gives interviews and so on. And he makes a very strong point. He says, you can have a tentpole franchise, and he uses these exact words. He points out that you can have a tentpole franchise but again, if you know anything about the audience, it's that they're going to get tired of it eventually. So you constantly have to keep spending on lesser things and lesser franchises that have the potential to grow up into a tentpole. And they may not be there yet. But if you think about it as, here's the Avengers, which is very se sort of serious, charged, action, superhero stuff. And here's Guardians of the Galaxy, which is really a talking raccoon and a tree, doing some weird shit in a corner, right? <laughs> but but that's the kind of but that's the kind of franchise, that's the kind of tentpole that eventually grows up to support or replace outright large chunks of that. And you have to sort of keep disrupting yourself this way. And you have to keep investing in other little pocket universes that you get, that you have going around. Now video game companies do this, film companies do this, authors have a massive advantage when it comes to doing this because our capital upfront costs are significantly lower. We can afford to take a lot more risks and keep throwing a lot more stuff at the wall in the hope that one of them will also rise to the position of being the money maker. So the conventional wisdom of, you know, write what makes you money, that's good. Really, keep writing what makes you money. Make sure that there's plenty of people who love it and you have your legion of fans and so on. But also keep trying to disrupt yourself. Because if not, someone else is going to come and do that for you. And then the market will shift. And then you'll be going, well, shit, last month I made seven figures a month. And this month I have nothing. I'm, I'm out on the street. Right? Uh, so yeah. So that is 
solo indie black swans will happen. Sometimes they might lead to co-pubs. Tradbub is not going to die because they're really large, slow, powerful machines. Yes, they're risk averse, but they're unparalleled at producing black swans. And they have, they've got enough staying power that they've got, got to this phenomenon that's almost too big to fail. Um, existing traditional black swans may play India. This was, this was sort of an interesting line of thinking. I was looking at Brandon Sanderson. Um, Brandon Sanderson has a company called Dragonsteel Entertainment. And Dragonsteel Entertainment is essentially an indie production company. Now imagine um, a book that has Brandon Sanderson Presents or J.K. Rowling Presents. J.K. Rowling runs Pottermore. Um, and there's David Weber and Richard Fox, of course, playing as well. Um, imagine having J.K. Rowling Presents on the top of your new urban fantasy book. That's just going to destroy the market completely. That is a potential game that could be played by people if they want to play it. So really, franchises, if you think about all the stuff that I've said about tent poles and so on and so forth, franchises are the absolute end game. In the world of white swans, in the world where you don't create just one product, in the world where you're committed to producing multiple products, franchises are the absolute end game. So what this leads to, and this is a picture of Japan in the warring states period, what this ideally should lead to is a sort of creative explosion of where each of these colored states is a little franchise, and it's run by a co-pub, and you have all of these different franchises out there, um, and they're all competing for readers' attention. Readers get the best of the lot, obviously, because you get so much variety that you can pick from. Um, authors have it a little bit tougher because you have to keep competing, but that is ideally what sort of so something this size should lead to. Right, but, yeah, you know. Uh, could be so much premature evaluation, right? Because there's also another industry that we need to consider. And I'm going to go fast through this because I'm being shown an iPad and that says this four minutes and 30 seconds, right? Blah, 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 right, whatever. <laughs> so thesis number two is creative BPO. And, I'll, and let's sort of flip to the next one, right? This, this is what I'm talking about. Um, these are two albums. This is one is from Lady Gaga and the other is from Beyonce. Um, you'll notice the names of producers there. And there's a guy called Blood Pop. There's Josh, Kevin Parker, Red One. There's Duplo. There's a whole bunch of names there. And you might be wondering why there's so many producers on an album. Well, these people are songwriters. These people are people who produce the beats of a music album. These people are people who produce tiny synthwave samplings and so on and so forth. They, they are behind, if you flip to the next one, right, so this guy, for example, Max Martin, is a producer. Uh, he, you might know some of the tracks that he's worked on. Um, Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby One More Time, that was him. Backstreet Boys, I Want It That Way. A lot of nice ink, uh, a lot of like 22 of the Billboard Hot 100 number one hits, including like I Kissed a Girl, Some Stuff from Maroon 5, Taylor Swift. His all, I mean, they've all had his fingerprints on it. And the reason this has happened is in the music industry, which also experienced digitization very fast, very early, um, the workload of creating a piece of music was split among multiple people. And it was split by, there was a traditional split of, here's the song, singer, songwriter, and you had your band doing the actual music. And it seemed a very natural split for people to go, okay, you know what, you do the singing. I'll do the songwriting. You, the other person, you do, the, you do all the recording and the drum lines and everything else. You, this other person, you do this one small thing. And together we'll collaboratively sort of create these things that are guaranteed chart toppers. Go to the next one. Right, so if you think about a successful story, right? You do, you, you know, and this is a very rudimentary breakdown. So you have your world building, you have your outlining, you have your writing, and then your agent comes in, then that goes to the publisher. The publisher handles your editing, your covers, your promotions, you know, giving you a pat on the back and so on and so forth. Next. Um, this could potentially be what it turns out to. You have a producer, very much like in the music industry, who comes and gives you your world. You have another person who says, right, here are the outlines of the story you can tell in that world. 
you have another person who comes in and says, fine, I'll take those outlines and I'll write it. And you have another person who says, all right, I'll edit that product. Another person who comes in with the covers, another person who handles the production and then of sort of getting it out there and the promotion and so on and so forth. So what you could end up, instead of the co-pubs and two people doing everything and putting stuff out there, is this nice chain industry. And if you go a little forward, yeah. Uh, actually, back. Yeah. Here are some excellent uh, universes that already do this. The Marvel Universe, the Warhammer 40K Universe, Star Wars, Cotherian. What basically happens is there is already a world. There are people who come and say, oh, all right, here are the outlines for the story in that world. Somebody else takes that, writes. Somebody else takes that, edits it. Somebody else takes that, puts a cover on it. And somebody else is responsible for making it, to getting it out in the world and so on. But there is one commonality here as well in that tentpole franchises are still the end game. In the world of White Swans, where you acknowledge that one book has only one chance of success, therefore you keep putting more, franchises are always going to be the end game. But this potentially changes the back end of how things operate. It doesn't change the front. It could be two people hammering away at a book on their own franchise. It could be a person who owns a franchise going, you, I'll hire you to write outlines. You, I'll have hire you to do covers. And that's the way a lot of these very successful universes already work. So you still end up with something like this. And here, it's always the people who own the franchise. In both these scenarios, it's the people who own this franchise that have all the power. So, yeah. So we are done almost exactly on time. And yes, there are some elements that I didn't or couldn't properly sort of expound on because we were a little strapped for time. But the ultimate end of this is the concept of the big publisher, that pers the, the creature or the entity in the middle that has all the capital, that has, is the only person capable of you know, handling all this warehousing distribution, all of that, that is slowly eroding. It, does not, it has not been invalidated because certain aspects of what a publisher can do have shifted to other arenas. What you are and what we are ending up with, what the indie world is sort of, the market is sort of trending towards, are these tiny little co-publisher outfits or people with universes in their pockets who can afford to pay writers, who can afford to pay cover designers, who can afford to pay a lot, who can afford to hire like 5, 10, 15 creatives and say, all right, this is my universe, let's go play in it. And this is still what it looks like to the reader. You have multiple warring franchises competing for your attention. And that's sort of where the whole publishing industry seems to be headed, if you look at it from the market. Now, I have to return to my point about Black Swans and say, this does not, in any sense, capture things that are going to happen at one person that's going to write the most spectacular book that rises to the top of the charts, sells 35 million copies, becomes the next Bible. Those can't be predicted. And I'm not going to claim to be able to predict that. This is the world of white swans. And whether you fit in in a co-pub, whether you design a universe and you look at hiring other people to work with you in it, whether you figure out where these existing universe in a pocket operations exist and seeing if you can plug in, it's entirely up to you. So thank you. Thanks, Yuta, for a great, uh, great presentation on the future of publishing. Yuta's a data analyst from uh, Sri Lanka. And it's the third time I've seen him this year. Saw him in Bali, then uh, we saw him in California, and now uh, we have him here. Because he was so impressive in, uh, in Bali and then in California with his stories. He's published two in uh, my anthologies. Yeah, there we go. Today was a great day. Today was a great day. Uh, yesterday was uh, working through some issues and making magic happen. And then uh, today, uh, yesterday I had three hours of my heart and tachycardia, and today I had zero, none, uh, not a single minute. So uh, stress is a is a contributor, as a, as a, it is for anyone's health.
you have to control your stress, and sometimes running a conference isn't the best thing for running your, your uh, controlling your stress. When I shouldn't have, we have great volunteers. Look at Ira up here helping out. The uh, AV team has been all star. Max Jolly up in the uh, in the booth <laughs> with Ira and Jamie making adjustments on the fly to the sound systems. And uh, if you watch the video in here, and then you click over to a video from uh, Red Rock or Hawthorne, it just looks really. It's like, oh my God, now I can't hear. It's fuzzy. Well, yeah, this is a half million dollar uh, camera system, and in there, it's a it's a hundred dollar web webcam. So there's there's going to be a difference, but still, all of them are recorded, and people at home are following along, but they're not getting as much as uh, the folks who are right here right now, because this is a uh, twenty bucks a fifty k educational and networking event. So take advantage of the networking. When we wrap today, head on out, meet somebody you haven't met before. Uh, let them buy you a drink. And uh, look forward to tomorrow. We'll wrap up strong tomorrow. It'll be another full day. So uh, try to get some sleep tonight. The Ram's Head Bar, our, we got surprised with that last night. It should be open till 2 tonight. So take advantage. Thank you very much for a great day.